two stories to talk about, one Sports Beat KC podcast today. It's Thursday, April 9th, and I'm Blair Kirkhoff. Bashard Breland has re-signed with the Chiefs. That is great news for the Super Bowl champions. Breland figured to be an attractive get for a team looking for a cornerback. Instead, he re-signed with the Chiefs. And if my depth chart reading is accurate, that's either 19 or 20 returning starters from the Super Bowl championship team. That's an incredible stat. Tell you what, that hashtag provided by Sammy Watkins last week, run it back, that's going to sell a lot of t-shirts this year. Beat writer Herbie Teope breaks down what the Breland signing means for the Chiefs. After a break, we talk border war football. That's right, border war football. We know Missouri and Kansas are resuming their basketball series in December, and there had been talk of renewing football as well. That football series talk took a step closer to becoming a reality on Thursday when Tigers Athletic Director Jim Sterk sent an email to donors saying that the schools were close to signing on the dotted line with Arrowhead Stadium as one of the venues. MU beat writer Suichi Tirada and KU beat writer Jesse Newell check in to talk Border War Football Edition. But first, here's Herbie Teope on Bashard Breland. Herbie, some Chiefs news today. There's always Chiefs news, it seems like. Never ends, but uh, but this is big. The the Chiefs signing uh, Bashard Breland, the cornerback, and one-year deal, I think, for um, up to $4.5 million. What is the significance of bringing back Bashard Breland? It's actually huge. When you think about what the Chiefs were facing two weeks before the draft, Shaveris Ward was their only starting cornerback from last year's Super Bowl winning team that they had on the roster. You, you lost Kendall Fuller to Washington, and Brilliant was still out there on the open market. And again, quite frankly, I'm very surprised in today's pass-happy NFL, he did not get a large contract with another team. But with his return, now the Chiefs have a lot of flexibility going into this draft. My two previous mock drafts, I kept pounding on the point that they needed a starting cornerback because all they had returning from last year was Ward. But with Breland back in the fold, now the team has a lot of flexibility here. You don't have to worry about another starting cornerback because you have your two bookends back in place here. You've got stability on the back end of coverage there. Breland was huge last year because if you remember, Blair, when you were covering the team in 2018 – they finished a dismal 31st against the, against the past. This past season really tightened down, really were stout against the past. They finished the regular season ranked eighth, and a lot of that has to do because the cornerbacks really clamped down on wide receivers. So with him back in the fold here, the Chiefs have a lot of flexibility going into this draft. They don't need to identify one of those high-end cornerbacks at the top of the draft. Yeah, so that was my next question. You know, the mock draft. Uh, I think the first one that you uh, that you issued last week, you had him taking the U- Utah cornerback, I believe. And, yep. Yep. And uh, which is somebody the Chiefs had communications with at the at the uh, combine. So does this change the approach? Uh, does it uh, does it give the Chiefs more flexibility? What? Uh, how does this? How might this impact the draft? We see, like, in my most recent mock draft, I decided to, to, to change it up a little. I was like, let me put a linebacker there, Zach Bond out of Wisconsin, because the Chiefs also have a need there at linebacker. And the, But I immediately followed it up with Bryce Hall from Virginia, the cornerback, because, again, we were operating under the premise that Breland was still on the open market. But with him back in the fold, I think the Chiefs can go linebacker. They can go a variety of positions there at pick number 32 in the second round as well as the third round. You don't necessarily have to go out there and grab a cornerback. Right now you're going to have Breland and Ward, and and I think Rashad Fenton, a guy that kind of flies under the radar, he's probably going to project probably to start off at that nickel cornerback position to replace Kendall Fuller. So they've they've got good depth right now. Surely it doesn't hurt in today's NFL to keep adding cornerbacks because that's what you have to do because teams pass it around so much, but now you don't have to do it early. You can wait until the latter part of the, of the draft, middle of the draft. You know, it, it, I'll never forget being in training camp before the 2018 season, and there was Breland visiting the, the Chiefs then and um, was on the field uh, talking, um, talking to Bob Sutton at the time and other coaches and actually walked past um, 
the, the media on, on, on the way back up the hill and was on a cell phone. So, you know, trying to avoid questions from from reporters. But even then, you could tell there was there was interest, you know, from the chiefs in him and they didn't sign him. They, that happened the, the following year. He was a difference making player, though, for the Chiefs this season. But Herbie, let's go back to something that you said earlier, and I, I think it's really interesting. This was a guy that you had identified as someone who might be able to cash in on his season and the success of the t- of the Chiefs winning the Super Bowl. It wasn't. It wasn't. You know, it didn't happen for him. Why didn't it happen for him? You know, that's that's a question that I do not know the answer to. I mean. I can look at the cornerback market right now, and then there are a lot of cornerbacks who didn't really cash in outside of a guys like Chris Harris, obviously, because, you know, he has name value. But I'm, I was very surprised right. that he wasn't able to do it. Kendall Fuller just happened to go back to a team that knows him very well. They drafted him. So that they certainly understand what Kendall Fuller brings. But Breland was, was kind of like a head-scratching moment to me. Why isn't this guy getting a lot of attention out there? Okay, hey, so it wasn't just um, you know Breland this week. Uh, Chiefs made a couple more moves, signed a couple other guys. Let's start with uh, running back uh, DeAndre Washington, a player that uh, has a certain quarterback kind of excited, I noticed from his Twitter account. Yeah, obviously we're talking about DeAndre Washington. Um, I'm not going to go crazy about him right now. He he's Right now he's a deaf move. You know, it's Damian Williams. Right. He's going to be competing for a roster spot against uh, – Darwin Thompson against Daryl Williams, uh, Elijah McGuire. You know, I think the, the, the Chiefs right now have a total of six, seven running backs on the roster. So right now he's a guy who's going to fill depth. And, of course, the, the quarterback I was referring to was Patrick Mahomes. Mm-hmm. They were they were teammates at uh, Texas Tech. So uh, inter- I know Patrick Mahomes tweeted him a, a nice greeting uh, from from his account. Also, uh, Tyler Newsom, the punter, uh, the Chiefs brought in. Like I think the Chiefs do this every year. Uh, they bring in a punter to uh, to work with uh, you know with the special teams, and you see him at the. You'll see this player at the. Uh, in, in, you know when when there are you know off season activities, um, but who knows if we're going to see that this year? But they did sign a punter. What what do we know about Tyler Newsom? Well, we know that he's got a big leg. That, that one we, we definitely know for sure. He averaged 44 yards per punt out of Notre Dame. And I think this is going to be interesting for Dustin Colquitt. You know, the longest tenured Chiefs currently on the roster right now just wrapped up his 15th season. Last year, don't forget the Chiefs brought in another punter to compete against him and Jack Fox. So this is two straight years where he's going to have a little competition. Colquitt turns 38 here at, at the end of the year. And and then not only – excuse me, in May. On May – um. Well, early May, he turns 38, and he's in the final year of his contract. So right now, it, it certainly makes a lot of sense to take a look at other punters. Can he supplant Colquitt? That remains to be seen. You know, But I think right now, the more legs you have in camp, if there is a training camp, you know, it, it certainly doesn't hurt. Very good. All right, Herbie Teope is going to be a very, very, very busy man over the next few weeks. When is he not covering this team? But uh, with the draft coming up, we'll be – talking a lot about the NFL draft and, and what the Chiefs are going to do, which which seems to change with every free agent signing or with every signing uh, that they have. So, Herbie, good talking to you, and we'll catch up again soon. Okay, thanks, Blair. Hey, it's Blair. Hey, we have a special subscription offer for Sportsbeat KC listeners, unlimited digital access to the Kansas City Stars award-winning sports coverage. Sign up now for one year of Sports Pass for access to all the sports news, features, and columns we have to offer. And it's only $30. That's a 40% savings off our regular rate. For your convenience, your subscription will automatically renew after the initial term at $50, unless you tell us to cancel. A lot of subscription services won't tell you that. They'll just sneak it on there. We just told you. Your subscription helps support the sports coverage of KansasCity.com and the Kansas City Star. Please visit KansasCity.com slash SportsBeatKC offer to get this special offer. And as always, thanks for listening. When we left the Border War football series, Missouri was riding a three-game winning streak, and the previous five games were played at Arrowhead Stadium. It looks like the schools will pick things up, although we don't know when. Beat writers Jesse Newell and Suichi Tirada are here to talk about Border War football. All right, guys. So what? What do we make of this 
it's news, right? I mean, uh, looks like uh, Kansas and Missouri resuming the border war in football. We know it's happening for sure in basketball, but today we find out that from uh, from Missouri, from the from the Missouri side of the border, that Jim Sterk has sent a notice to um, to season ticket holders that it's in the works. Is that about how it came down, Suichi? Yeah, so Jim Sterk essentially sends an email out to donors and just says that KUMU is looking to restart back up in football. And really, the only newsworthy point of this is that it's going. It sounds like it's going to be a four game series, which we have confirmed. Um, otherwise, though, they've been in works for months now. I mean, the border. I, I remember on my third day of working at the Star, the border war came back for the men's basketball side, and so ever since then, we've been hearing that football is imminent and coming back soon and here we are finally getting some news on that front during a pandemic (laughs) yeah and jesse you've been hearing the same thing over at ku well yeah it's uh again we we wrote about this a few months ago uh back in november and back at that time football was sort of being mentioned in there even if it wasn't an official thing and even then um jeff long kind of talked about conservatively he hoped that this series could get done by the mid 2020s or the early 2030s. But uh, obviously these scheduling things are a little bit difficult to tackle when it comes to football, just because you schedule these things so far out in advance and and you have these home and homes or two out of threes or three out of four set up so far that um, just to, to drop everything and say, Hey, it's time to set up KU Missouri and football. It's a little bit more difficult than meets the eye. So uh, yeah, I, I think that this is um, it, it seemed like when they, start up the basketball part of this, which would be the bigger deal, I think, for all parties involved, probably, um, that it opened the door, obviously, for these two parties to get together and say, it's time to do football as well. So um, not too much crazy new news today, I don't think, other you know than just talking about the four-game series that Suichi mentioned. But uh, yeah, it seemed like it was in the works, and so I guess I'm not shocked by it, just because, uh, to me, the bigger shock was basketball. Once that happened, it seemed like about anything was going to be on the table. Right, and just to review, the the basketball series is going to resume this next season, uh, the upcoming season. First game at Sprint Center. It's a six-game series, I believe, right? First game at Sprint Center, second game in Lawrence, and then and then it alternates Lawrence, Columbia, and, and back at Sprint Center at some point. So, um, Suichi, so I'm looking at Missouri's future non-conference opponents, and um, I've got four – the, the uh, you know the four that fill out an SEC schedule because they only play eight league games. I've got four on Missouri's schedules through 2025. Um, that's not to say that that opponents couldn't be moved or you couldn't shake things up a little bit on the schedule, but I, I find no no room at the end right now for for an additional non conference football game for the Tigers. What do you think might happen there? Yeah, so football is weird, right, just because scheduling the way it works out is that you have to do this years in advance. And there are the jokes, right, that you schedule a game in 2030, and you're like, well, you know, class of 20, whatever, in high school are going to be playing this. So it is a little bit more difficult with football. Um, as you mentioned, they don't have an opening until 2026, uh, even with the SEC schedule with four games. So it, it sounds like, ideally, you either buy out an opponent a non-conference opponent and you know if it's the central michigan or eastern michigan that's a little bit easier to do it costs money but if you are playing k you're hopefully making that back so either you buy out an opponent you reschedule an opponent those are really your only options for football just because this that's just how it works so it is a little tricky i think just with football scheduling compared to basketball i mean basketball you have so many games one game and a 31 game schedule with all those non-coms isn't going to move the needle much, but football, there's just so much preparation that needs to be done there. Yeah, and by the way, in 2022 and 23, Missouri is scheduled uh, with a two-game series with Kansas State. Uh, The Wildcats uh, would host the game in 2022, and the game would be in Columbia in 2023. And, of course, Arrowhead's being discussed for uh, part of this uh, future border war, and we know that Missouri – is playing in Arrowhead, returning to Arrowhead this coming football season against Arkansas, the battle line uh, rivalry. And that game is uh, to end the the 2020 regular season. Jesse, what do do we know about future KU football schedules? 
Well, there, there's a list of them. Uh, obviously, I don't think they're quite as tied in uh, as what Missouri is right now as far as the future ones go. But like most schools out there, they do have some on the books for, you know, a, a ways from now. So it, it's probably the same scenario. And I, I think if we're just looking at this from a big picture uh, perspective here, where you're saying, okay, how can KU make room in the schedule? How can Missouri make room in the schedule? All these sorts of things. I think what Suiji said is absolutely accurate, which is like, look, if KU Missouri can happen, we know there's going to be interest. We know there's going to be money. We know there's going to be fans. Uh, you make it work. And so uh, for KU, it looks just a quick look at this. Looks like they are basically scheduled out through 2024, 2025, that, that sort of range for these non-conference opponents. So uh, potentially that's where Jeff Long was talking about starting it maybe mid-2020s and 2026. But again, things can happen. Things can shift. Potentially you can uh, pay a certain opponent to say, hey, take this money and go find a different opponent down the line. But uh, th- this seems to me to be uh, an action on KU's part to to try to, to get some interest. You know, I, I know that for football, Jeff Long already has made it a, a big priority to bring in additional staff members and analysts and to try to fully fund the football program, which was not being done in some of the previous years when KU had struggles. And it seems like they're potentially here looking to try to to get every ounce of revenue they can out of football and if that means you schedule your biggest rival and you take some of the gate from the opposing fans that come and you get more concessions all those sorts of things uh, i think that's something that ku would pursue just because they're trying to fully fund a football program that has not been fully funded or funded to the level that uh, power five programs usually are here over the course of the past few years and i cannot remember the financial details i don't have them at my fingertips i'll of course, I will. As soon as we finish, I'll look them up. But uh, when when Missouri and Kansas moved their rivalry from campus sites to Arrowhead Stadium, starting in two thousand and seven, the I want to say there was uh, between a million and two million guarant- per team guaranteed, and uh, and that was going to go through the length of what was then a six year contract. The um, the, the series didn't get to six years because after the fifth, Missouri left the Big 12 for the SEC. And that, of course, started the, the border Cold War standoff that, uh, that, that Kansas took, really. Uh, Missouri wanted to continue the series with Kansas in, in all sports, and it was Kansas that turned its back on, on Mizzou. And we know that the, uh, that is thawing now because of the basketball series. But – what are the chances, Jesse, that we see a first uh, renewed KUMU football game with the same rankings as the as, as the Jayhawks and Tigers had in 2007? <laughs> well, <laughs> not quite that high, but you know, I, I think I think you speak to a good point, Blair, which is. You know, I just put a poll out real early here on Twitter to kind of gauge KU fans' interest about this and whether they'd be in favor of it. And it's looking like right now 69% of them say that they are in favor of playing Missouri in football, uh, 31% not. And for a long time, there was sort of a lot of, I don't know, lack of a better term, propaganda potentially thrown out there that, hey, KU playing Missouri is like not in KU's best interest and it's doing Missouri a favor and all these sorts of things, especially when it came to the basketball series. But at a base level, I think you're speaking to the correct thing here, which is this is fun. Uh, it's, it's good to get these two groups together. It's good to have a rivalry. It's good to renew this thing. And the 2007 game, obviously, at Arrowhead was unlike any other because of the two teams ranking. And then, uh, you know, a, a year later with the big snowflakes and Todd Reesing yeah. and uh, Todd Reesing throwing to Kerry Meyer with the, for the big touchdown in the end zone. I mean, those are the type of moments that I can easily pull off the top of my head 12 years later, 13 years later, because these two teams played each other. So I, I think at a very base level, um, some Kansas fans will uh, not like this because for a long time they've sort of been told that they should not play Missouri and that that should you know KU should not do things to benefit Missouri. But again, if, if you go from the the five thousand foot view of this, KU's going to play Missouri in football, and I think for sports writers, for fans, for uh, for a lot of interested parties out there, it just makes the game and the sport and the whole thing a lot more fun. So I, I think that's a good thing, whether this starts up here in a few years or starts up a little bit further down the road. I guess we'll have to see. But KU Missouri and football has had some great moments, and uh, hopefully that continues in the future when these two teams get back on the gridiron and play again. 
Yeah, as a history lesson to Suichi, who um, uh, was probably in, in uh, middle school in that 2007, maybe not even there. No, I, I don't know. No, you're, no. You're, no, you're, no, you're, no, you're no before that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <it might laughs> have been in movie school, honestly, now that I think about it a little harder. <laughs> Um, it was a two, three game and the winner was going to go to number one. I can't remember who was two and maybe Missouri. I can't remember who was two and three, but, uh, the winner of the, the border war in 2007 was going to go to number one because on the Friday, um, before that game on Saturday, LSU top rank LSU had lost to Arkansas. So the craziest things, I mean, 80, 80,000 people at Arrowhead game day, it was the, one of the most incredible sporting events that I've witnessed in my 30 years, 30 plus years in Kansas city to have those two football programs meeting that late in the season for a chance to be ranked number one. And, and at that point head into the postseason with a chance to play the winner play for the national championship uh, was just mind blowing. And no, I don't expect that to happen again. And you're right, Jesse, the game, the following year in the snow, at Arrowhead, of course, Missouri won the game. The first one at at, um, at Arrowhead turned around and lost to Oklahoma in the Big Twelve Championship game. Kansas came back and won the second game in the snow. The the Todd Reesing to Kerry Meyer touchdown pass at the end, and so both teams had just great moments and memories from that series. Missouri continued to go on and win the next three games, and uh, and then I like I said, the sixth game was um, uh, after that after the the fifth game in the series. Uh, they, they haven't played since then, but I, I would um, I would certainly welcome it. Look forward to it. I'm glad that the uh, again that the the feelings are at least softened a little bit toward playing this game. And I don't know who this leaves in college football. Maybe besides if and when this happens, besides Texas and Texas A and M not meeting uh, because I believe Pitt and West Virginia have future football games scheduled. It just seems like um, college sports uh, understanding. Uh, they, they need to make money where they can. These are money-making opportunities, and, uh, and it just doesn't make sense not to play a college football or college basketball game with, with a rival. So it's on its way. We know it's coming for basketball. I absolutely cannot wait for that. And uh, in December, I believe, isn't, and it, it's in December, right? Not November, but December in its Sprint Center. December, I believe, 12th, 2020 at the Sprint Center. Hopefully we'll be playing basketball by then. That's the uh, that's the hope right now. Yeah, that is the hope. Um, as we um, this would have been we would have been uh, completing the first almost the first week with uh, f- after the after the final four. The final four would have ended Monday earlier this week. As um, and uh, and of course we, that that didn't happen. All right, that's great. Hey, listen, Suichi, Jesse, thanks for joining us, and we will talk to you guys again soon. Well, that'll do it for today. Thanks to our production crew of Derek Donovan, Savannah Smith, Randy Mason, Beth Welsh, Jeff Rosen, and Chris Fickett. Links to the stories that were topics today can be found in the show notes in the Kansas City Star and on KansasCity.com. Hey, and you know how to get a Star digital subscription, right? Account.KansasCity.com slash subscribe. That's account dot kansascity.com slash subscribe thanks for listening and we'll be back on friday with another episode of sports bkc where we talk sports in kansas city every day